evening, everyone, and welcome to the weekly meeting of the oldest club of its kind on the air today, the MGM Radio Movie Club. Meeting is called to order, and I give you your director, George Nard. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and good evening, members and friends. I don't have to tell you what a pleasure it is to be with you all again and conduct on your behalf another session of the MGM Radio Movie Club. And first on the list of the minutes which are filled with everything guaranteed to make you feel happy that you're a member is the latest news of Hollywood, the latest happenings in the loves and lives of your screen favorites told by that well-known motion picture columnist and commentator, the personal friend of all the stars, Grady Harris. So, are you ready? Ready. Then light. Camera. Action. Thank you, George, and hello, everybody. In raising the curtain tonight to give you the latest news of the London, Hollywood, and New York front, I hear that Lila Himes and her aging husband, Phil Berg, are thinking things over. When Mary Carlyle celebrated her 21st birthday in London last week, Jim Blakely phoned his congratulations from Hollywood. They spoke for about an hour, and now Jim is wondering how long he'll have to work to pay off the bill. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., accompanied by his father, will plane in from the coast on Monday. Doug Sr. is still trying to persuade Doug Jr. to sail to China with him to play the lead in his production of Mrs. Marco Polo. But young Doug is due back in London next month to start his own production of Knights of the Round Table. It will be a case of Walter Walter everywhere at the House of Morgan Monday night on account of Walter Wolf King and Walter O'Keefe will be La Morgan's guest of honor. If the blessed event anticipated by Hannah and Jack Dempsey in June isn't a boy, his parents are going to be that disappointed. Add arrivals of the week. Freddie Bartholomew and his aunt Sissy at the Warwick, Genevieve Tobin at the St. Regis, Anne Pennington at the Algonquin, the Sam Goldwyns and the Clarence Browns at the Waldorf, and Frank Lawton, who has joined his wife Evelyn Lay at the Gotham. Colette Darville, Dean Taylor's French doll, is being screen tested by every film company. Colette has already made a Spanish picture in Hollywood, a French picture in Spain, and an English picture in France. Now she's wondering if she ought to go to Ethiopia to make it one in Technicolor. Although Finney Bonds denies a rift in her marriage to Sam Joseph, that isn't preventing her from dancing cheek to cheek with Don Alvarado. Lily Payne sails on the Conte de Savoia next Saturday to sing five performances with the Monte Carlo Opera Company. She returns the middle of April to resume her broadcast here before reporting at the RKO Studios this summer for further screen work. That tremendous crowd meeting the 20th century at Grand Central tomorrow morning will be on hand to mob Gary Cooper. Unfortunately for you and me, Gary's visit here will be a brief one. He leaves again Wednesday for a two-month holiday in Bermuda. He'll be accompanied by Mrs. Cooper. But cheer up, girls. Robert Young is due back from London on the Aquitania, and perhaps he can be, pers be persuaded to linger a while. You see how excited uh, I get when I talk about Robert Young. After watching Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers in their new picture, Now Jamming the Music Hall, it seems to me a far more appropriate title would be Follow the Feet. And by the way, keep your eye on Harriet Hilliard, who makes a film debut in this one. She doesn't have to sing Get Thee Behind Me, Satan, to be tempted from a brilliant screen future. And now for my recommended preview of the week. Tonight it is a Gaumont British production, Rose, which has its New York premiere at the Roxy next Friday. Last summer in London, when Walter Houston told me the dramatic tale of this empire builder who had so much to do in so little time, who died, you know, at the age of 49, it sounded like a powerful story ideally suited to screen transcription. 
After seeing it this week, I still think it has power and moments of great emotional drama. But where I wept actual tears when Walter Houston outlined it for me over a lunch table, the screen version left me unmoved. Perhaps it's because the tempo was too slow, or the various incidents depicting Rhodes' struggle to realize his dream of a united South Africa are too episodic. And yet, oh, handicapped is subsisted by Walter's role and Oscar Hamaka, who plays the part of his enemy, Paul Kruger. This German actor is a brilliant artist, a combination of Charles Lawton and Emil Gaumont British is to be congratulated for a of contract. And now for the big scoop of the evening. Tonight, I have two celebrated personalities my, as my guests of honor, two people whose talent I admire and whose friendship I value so much, Johnny Green and Jack Whiting. A little later in the program, I'll be back to introduce them to you. Until then, on with the show, George. Thank you, Whiting. And now for Frank Hernandez, the movie club serenader who tonight is presented in company with Con Maffey at the console of the organ. In answer to the majority of requests, Frank sings Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo." <laughs> Radio Movie Club now has the pleasure to present the guests of the evening, who, as usual, will be interviewed by Rady Harris. Will you do the honors, please, Rady? I'm laughing already. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Several days after I had arrived in Hollywood, I ran into a famous director whom I used to know at the Paramount Studios on Long Island. He greeted me cordially and asked me what I was doing these days. With a deadpan, I answered, I'm selling Jell-O now. He looked at me sympathetically and said, gee, that's a shame, and a guy with your talent. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're on the country's number one radio program. But no fooling, Johnny. How did you like your first visit to Hollywood? It was grand, Rady. You see, although it was my first visit, it really was just like old home week for me, because everybody I had ever worked with or known in New York seemed to be out there. For instance, at the United Artists Studio, Ethel Merman was being featured with Eddie Cantor in Strike Me Pink. It wasn't so very many years ago that I accompanied Ethel at the piano in her first appearance at the casino in the park here in New York and at her record-breaking engagement at the Palace, when to play the Palace was the goal of every vaudevillian. At Warner Brothers, I staged a reunion with Joan Blondell. It was the first time I had seen her since we played a personal appearance together in Minneapolis over two years ago. But at RKO, I got the biggest kick out of seeing a young star who has been one of my very closest friends ever since I played for her when she made her first screen test at the Paramount Studio. It was for a picture called Young Man of Manhattan, and she sang a song entitled, I've Got It, But It Don't Do Me No Good. Well, let me tell you, the fellow who titled that number certainly was no prophet because that little girl happened to be Ginger Rogers. Now we're getting somewhere. Tell me more, Johnny, much more. Oh, mais oui, avec plaisir, mademoiselle. 
Il y a bien des petites histoires de Hollywood que je voudrais bien vous dire ce soir, mais malheureusement, il n'y a pas de temps. Johnny, I never would have believed it. I see. <laughs> well, that French is less you don't know the Claudette Colbert influence. She's been my favorite French pastry ever since my fingers doubled for hers at the piano in the musical sequence in Smiling Lieutenant, when Claudette was supposed to teach Miriam Hopkins how to win Maurice Chevalier by jazzing it up with lingerie. Did you see Claudette's lovely new home in Homeby Hills? Did I see it? And by the way, there's a funny story attached to that. Another one? Oh, yeah, I got a million of them. <laughs> you know, when the foundation was just being built, I used to go horseback riding every morning through a path leading right past her new house. And since the framework wasn't up yet, me and my wonder horse would sort of stroll through the living room and doggone if I didn't want into the stables one night and heard my partner telling the other horses that he'd been entertained in Claudette Colbert's living room. <laughs> Well, I bet all the other mares wish they had his horse then. Oh, Rady. After that crack, if I had a cold, I'd ride right back to Hollywood on it. <laughs> but not until I finish this interview. I hear that along with your radio work and making Paramount shorts, you also made the phonograph recordings of the score of Follow the Fleet. Yes, I did, Rady, and it was a tough job. We worked from 8 in the morning to 8 the same night, but no one seemed to mind, least of all Fred Astaire. Now, there's one of the grandest guys I've ever worked with as I discovered when we worked together a few months ago doing the recordings of Top Hat. You know, Fred is crazy about music, and he was so tickled when Irving Berlin wrote a tune for him to sing in Follow the Fleet called I'd Rather Lead a Band. You know, I think he really would rather lead a band. We made a big business deal. Fred gave me a tap or two, and I gave him some new chords. I think he had the better of it, though, because he knew how to play the piano before we started, and I was, <laughs> well, you know, I was just the ballroom wallflower. Oh, you can't make me believe that, Johnny. Not with all those glamorous Hollywood stars around you. By the way, it must have been pretty hard working in Hollywood with all of them to distract you. Well, Reddy, working in Hollywood is like a golf game. It all depends on your approach. For some people, all those glamorous stars might prove distracting. But for me, they were inspiration. Oh, <laughs> so you're going into your accent again. Well, you can blame that on Jack Benny. You know, I went out to California a musician, and I came back a dialectician. <laughs> but speaking of Jack, he's really tops off the stage as well as on. In fact, one of the nicest things that happened to me in Hollywood was the surprise birthday party that Jack and his wife, Mary Livingston, gave me. I honestly believed him when he called me to hurry over to his house for a conference. I think I had on a pair of overalls, but I rushed over immediately. I should have caught on when I saw the congestion of automobiles in front of his house. But I thought it was just some of Jack and Mary's friends, wa fans, pardon me, waiting outside for autographs. So I walked in, and about a hundred people greeted me with, Happy birthday to you. Was my face green? Ouch. <laughs> and now, Rady, you have a delightful guest of honor to interview, Mr. Jack Whiting, so I think I'd better run along. Good night, folks. Wait a minute, Johnny. Haven't you forgotten something? No, I've got my hat and coat and gloves. I didn't forget anything. What about that? The piano? Oh, Rady, you're kidding. They wouldn't let me take that. Oh, you're not supposed to take it, Johnny. All you have to do is to sit down, think of some of your own tunes, and play, John. <laughs> Thank you. 
didn't forget them, but you see, they're restricted. I'm not allowed to play them. Isn't that a fine kettle of fish when a composer can't play his own tunes? <laughs> well, I, I certainly appreciate you playing your tunes that aren't restricted. Many thanks. What? And now hold everything, because here comes the Jack of Hearts, who is the cream in your coffee in such Broadway hits as the Ramblers, Hold Everything, America's Sweetheart, Take a Chance, and Calling All Stars. For the past 10 months, he has been in London, where he scored such an individual hit in the English production of Anything Goes, that they've named the Union after him. You know, Union Jack. Tonight, I'm not going to introduce him as a swell singer and dancer you all know, but as one of the nicest friends it is my privilege to have. It's a great thrill to have him back in New York and on this program tonight. And now, Jack, the microphone is yours. And remember, anything goes. Oh, thanks, Reddy. It's a great thrill to be back, seeing you and all my other old friends, including this American Mike. Is the London wireless? I didn't spend last summer in London for nothing. Mm. Very different? Oh, no. Technically, they're exactly the same, of course. But their method of broadcasting is entirely different. For instance, just before I left, we eat at a special program of Anything Goes. Now, in New York, if such a big broadcast were to take place, th there would have been hours of rehearsals with the principals and band, and the timing would have to be to the second. But in London, they, well, they took everything in a much more leisurely and relaxed fashion. And the night we broadcast, everyone but me arrived at the studio a half an hour before the program. I, of course, was there an hour before. And no one, no one seemed to worry when we ran a few minutes overtime. Well, that may, they may be more relaxed about their radio programs, but they're equally as energetic as any of us Americans when it comes to fan worship. I saw the gallery girls waiting for you at the stage door night after night. Oh, they are loyal, aren't they? D did you know that there's a group of them called the Gallery First Nighters who sit in the gallery every first night and pass judgment with applause or booze? And it is their verdict that often determines the success or failure of a play. The president of the club told me that uh, if they hadn't liked me and anything goes, I could never have stayed in London. <laughs> and now they won't let you leave, except for this limited holiday. When do you go back, Jack? On oh, March the 11th, in time to start rehearsals for the new Drury Lane show, and to appear for Irving Asher in a picture at the Warner Studios in Teddington. I hope this doesn't mean that you've deserted us for good, does it? No, not unless you desert me first. No, Rady, just as soon as the Drury Lane show finishes its run, I hope to be dancing back to another musical on Broadway. Jack, here's a question that's puzzled me for a long time. Why didn't you do any dancing in Anything Goes? Well, frankly, Rady, it had me puzzled, too. But Mr. Cochran explained that he wanted the show in London to be exactly the same as it was played in New York. And as Bill Gaxton, who played the part here, didn't dance, he didn't think I should either. Well, Mr. Cochran said he would do his best to find a spot for me. And, and one day during the, in the throes of rehearsal, he said, Jack, at last I found a place for you to dance. Well, naturally, I was terribly elated at that and eagerly asked where. Well, his reply was, at my mammoth charity benefit. <laughs> With my face red, I mean green. Uh, uh, <laughs> I say, did, did someone mention my name? Hello again, Johnny. You know Jack Whiting, don't you? Uh, of course, certainly. Frankly jolly having you back again, old son. Oh, thanks, Johnny. It's nice seeing you again, too. Tell me, what are you doing these days? Oh, it's terribly nice of you to be so interested, old son. I'm, I'm selling jello. Oh, Johnny. I'm sorry to hear that in a fellow with your talent. Quick, George, the guy. Uh, I said, Jack, I hear you were simply ripping over there. You know, quite the rage and all that sort of thing. But tell me, how long have you been away? You haven't the trace of a monocle in your throat. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been gone about ten months, Johnny. I just got back two weeks ago, as a matter of fact. By the way, when were you last over? Oh, I spent a weekend there uh, two years ago. Pardonnez-moi, je vous dire quelque chose. Hey, what is this, a League of Nations? No, I just thought I'd get an accent in somewhere. Anyway, this is my cue to ask Jack one last question. Oh, bless you, my sweet. The wireless is yours. <laughs> Jack, mm -hmm. as a very special favor, would you favor us with a song? Now, Rady, when you ask a favor, anything goes. As a gesture to Johnny Green, I'd like to sing his newest hit, introduced in the film Professional Soldier. It's called Joan of Arkansas. Down in the country where old Sarsone 
lived a farmer's daughter by the name of Joan. Shy as a bunny and as funny, but a honey when caressed. She's not a Crawford, and yet she's known. Only thing in common is the name of Joan. She's just a silly, daffodilly, pilly pilly from the west. Oh, Joan of Arkansas, just an ordinary gal to her pa and ma. Yes, she knocks you flat when you see her in an old straw hat. down the lane after half past four. Even Lazy Bone gets his work and done to meet Miss Joe. She's a local sensation, no one knows why, just a country relation, simple and shy. In her gingham creation, winking her eye to the farmer in the dell, she's too well. Oh, John of Arkansas, like a diamond in the rough, she's without a flaw. Grown in Arkansas, just a little bit of seed and a little bit of hay and a little bit of hay, hay too. She's a local sensation, no one knows why. Just a country relation, simple and shy. In her gingham creation, winking her eye to the farmer in the dell. She's well, oh, Joan of Arkansas, like a diamond in the rough, she's without a flaw. Grown in Arkansas, just a little bit of seed and a little bit of hay and a little bit of hay, hay, too. Thank you, Jack. And now, how about one of Johnny's old hits? Out of nowhere, Johnny. Jack, the honor is all mine. Let it go. You came to me from out of nowhere. You took my heart and found it free. Wonderful dream. Wonderful schemes from nowhere Made every hour sweet as a flower to me If you should go back to your nowhere Leaving me with a memory I'll always wait for your return out of nowhere, hoping you'll bring your love to me. And now until next Friday night at the same time, this is Rady Harris, Jack Whiting, and Johnny Green saying good night. Good night. <laughs>
This is the weekly meeting of the MGM Radio Movie Club, WHN, New York.